John Broxton, and on behalf of the International Film Music Critics Association, I'd like to present the 2015 IFMCA Award for Best Action, Adventure or Thriller Score to Joe Kramer for Mission Impossible Prognation. Thank you very much, John. You're welcome. And thank you to the International Film Music Critics Association for this honor. It's a very gratifying to know that the work that I worked so hard on, as well as my crew, John Finkley, Matt Dunkley, Ian Arbor, Casey Stone, Chris McQuarrie, Tom Cruise. Um, it's very gratifying to know that the work we did has been appreciated by film music fans and movie fans throughout the world. So thank you once again, and uh, I'll see you on the next one. <laughs> cool. Uh, Joe, congratulations again on winning the award. Um, thank you very much. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you got involved with Mission Impossible? I mean, obviously, you have the history with Chris McQuarrie. Mm -hmm. um, was it a given that you were going to score it right from day one? Well, I don't take anything for granted. So when I heard that Chris uh, officially got the job, uh, of course, I was excited and I was hopeful that, you know, he and Tom would come to me for Mission Impossible 5. But I also knew that Michael had established a pretty strong legacy with 3 and 4. And I knew that Bad Robot was involved in the film. And so, you know, I was, uh, I think, justifiably thoughtful that it could very well have been something Michael would have been asked to do. Michael G. Aquino. Um, I was very grateful and relieved when Chris called me and asked me to do the film. Um, a lot of that was, I was brought on actually unusually early because I was helping consult during the actual filming of the prolonged opera sequence uh, that makes up most of Real 2 in the movie. And because they needed somebody with like a musical expertise on the set to make sure that they didn't paint themselves in a corner when they filmed the opera sequence, uh, they flew me over and I was there for five weeks for that. And so I had this... Uh, while I was there, I had opportunities to speak with Tom and Chris about the score and about the kind of music that they wanted I had done Reacher with Chris, and that's where I met Tom. And they were both big fans of the sort of retro approach that I took in my score for Reacher, so that was sort of the principal direction I was given. And so after I finished the opera, I came back to L.A. for about two or three months. And while I was here, I did some research, which involved going back and looking at the original episodes of the TV show. I sort of decided as a matter of principle, if you will, that I didn't want to go back and look at the feature films at all once I got the job because I felt like I didn't want to, honestly, I didn't want to crib from what Hans or Danny or Michael had done. I wanted to sort of, I don't know, I wanted to be able to say with a clean conscience that I hadn't stolen from them. You know what I mean? Right. Whereas Lalo, I didn't care. I'll steal from that all day long, <laughs> you know, uh, in the sense that we were, as a filmmaker, Chris sort of told me, don't think of this as a sequel to those films. Think of it as a continuation of the TV show. Right. So that's sort of, that's what led me to make those decisions. Right. You know? So using Lalo's themes and then the piece from, from Ness and Dorma, um, I mean, obviously they played a big part in your score. Was that something that was a always a part of it like they had originally asked you to do it or was it just your own thought process of how the score should develop that that was how that came into it well I'll tell you how it started for me personally was that a pet peeve of mine is films that are part of a franchise where a composer does the first film the second film maybe the first few and they establish a sound for the film and then other composers are brought in and they depart from that sound, which is totally valid and great. But then at some point, somebody puts something from the other sound back in the movie. Right. And you end up with this weird, almost like a needle drop of like the theme from the first movie coming back in. And it sounds nothing like the rest of the score. And I, didn't, I wanted to try and avoid that with my work on this film. I knew that we would have the fuse sequence with scenes from the movie sort of foreshadowing and misleading the audience, much like the TV show did. And I knew that would have to have the theme. I suppose it's similar to like a Star Wars film, at least one of the episode films, I don't know what they're going to do with Rogue One, where you have the yellow crawl. We have to have that two minutes of the main title, no matter who's scoring the film. You know what I mean? And similarly, I felt that way about Mission. Starting from there, I know this is a long answer, I apologize. <laughs> Starting from there... 
I felt like the whole score needed to be sort of in that same neighborhood of sound that Lalo pioneered in order for that moment not to stick out. As far as Ness and Dorma goes, it just felt like something from the opera was a there was a great opportunity to use something from the opera to tie us in emotionally with Ilsa Faust with Rebecca Ferguson's character. Mm -hmm. And we I actually tried a couple of different things from the opera and I showed them all to Chris and Nessun Dorma was the one that resonated most strongly with him. That's such a famous so. piece though. I mean, were, mm -hmm. were you not concerned that it would you know, take the audience out of it because they're so aware of it from other media? Um well, in terms of inter integrating it into my score, mm -hmm. no. I tried to reference it obliquely enough, right. especially at first, that it wasn't quite obvious. That the audience would go, the musically savvy in the audience might go, hey, he stole that from Puccini. And then realize, oh, no, he was foreshadowing. Right. The people who wouldn't necessarily pick up on it, you know, it didn't make a difference. You right. know what I mean? I suppose you could take it a step further back and say it was risky to use that aria at all in the film. Uh... But that was a decision Chris made long before I was part of the project. That was in the script. The uh, villain theme that you wrote, mm -hmm. a very positive uh, response from a lot of film music. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how you came up with that idea? And yeah. It's very, very snaky, very, you know. Yeah. Um, working with Chris McQuarrie uh, is a very uh, drawn, sorry, Working with Chris McQuarrie is a, a long process because of the way he makes his films. He doesn't use temp music right. as an ed in the editing room. He doesn't use any temp score. Temp is eventually brought into the film for test screenings because you can't show a movie to an audience without any music. It'll just lay there. But by the time that the temp is brought in, I've already been working with Chris long enough that we're not sort of competing... The same way you would be competing if you were brought in at the end of the process and shown a movie with a temp score and saying, we love that, do that. You know what I mean? Right. So there's a lot of exploration in my work with Chris. And it's unique with Chris. You know, I, I, I have other directors where it's much more like the other situation or, you know, some blend of both. But Chris is the only director I know who is not afraid to cut without music. Um, uh... As a result, I'm sort of finding the voice for the film myself with Chris, with the picture editor, in a way that composers, I think, should be allowed to do, but often aren't. Because they're brought on after the musical identity of the film has already been established by the temp score. Yeah. So Chris and I discussed the movie. What's the movie about? Like, what is the movie? And in, in early parts of our discussion... Uh, Sean Harris was a much more concrete figure in the film. He was much more present. He had a, uh, at least one major scene with Tom earlier in the film. And it was decided through the editing process that uh, it was more interesting to have him be a little more ethereal. and less. So he and Tom don't meet face to face now until the very end of the film. And... It occurred to me that in the same way that the villain's theme was really the heart of the score to The Empire Strikes Back, maybe the, the heart to this score was going to be the villain's theme. And so I thought, well, in order to even start carrying out that idea, I need to compose a proper sort of concert arrangement of the villain's theme. And so I wrote what ended up being track two on the CD yeah. as the theme for the villain, Again, thinking of the character that Chris had written, who was very much like a snake charmer, you know what I mean? Solomon Lane very much used words to seduce uh, disillusioned agents to his syndicate that he was building. Okay. And I felt like the theme should convey some of that. And that's how I came up with what I came up with. There's always that leap that takes place between the intellectual idea and the realizing of it, and I can't really articulate what that is. That's right. sort of... That's the magic, if you will, of any artistic endeavor, you know, where your brain makes a leap. But that's about as much as I can explain about how that happened. Uh, you touched on your relationship with, with Chris McQuarrie. This is your 
well, the third major film after Way of the Gun, mm-hmm. Jack Reacher. Now, can you talk a little bit more about your relationship with him and what he brings to it as a director in terms of your music? You know, yeah. How does he it articulate was, what he wants? Yeah, sure. It was very interest. It's been very interesting working with Chris over the years. Uh, the first thing we actually did together was a pilot for NBC and Warner Brothers called The Underworld, where he was uh, more producerial, and that sort of set in motion our working method, which tends to be me generating a bunch of ideas and then presenting them to him, and he inevitably finds something in 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 the initial presentation that excites him and makes him start to think about the movie in a different way even and for this piece the underworld we ended up uh he ended up coming to my studio and sort of sitting with me while i tried different variations using this one idea that he had liked in a demo i had played for him uh way of the gun um started with a trailer that Artisan Entertainment at the time wanted to stick on the Blair Witch Project VHS tape. It was a little 30-second teaser for The Way of the Gun. Mm -hmm. And he suggested I listen to uh, some what scores, some Western scores. And I sort of heard one that did some cool stuff with castanets, and I was inspired by that. And I did my own thing with castanets and and then a uh, sort of... um, propulsive tune which even at the time ironically enough some people compared to the mission impossible theme which is sort of a funny bit of foreshadowing and i did that for the trailer and everybody liked it and then we went to do the film and i looked at the film and said well that trailer music will never work in the movie it's not it's not right and we chris and i went the long way around to coming all the way back to that trailer music and saying maybe that is right and then building the whole score off of that and the trailer music had been something I'd banged out in like, you know, 10 minutes. You know, because it was only like 30 seconds long. So sometimes it's those intuitive, instinctive ideas that end up being right as much as you try to intellectualize away from it. So those are a couple examples of how Chris and I get ideas. The big challenge on Mission Impossible was action music. Because in none of the projects that I'd worked on with Chris had we scored action sequences before. Both in Way of the Gun and uh, Jack Reacher, music really serves to build us up to the point of action. And then it cuts out and sound design takes over. And I know it was a real challenge to find a voice for the action music that Chris was comfortable with. That also satisfied what Tom wanted as a producer, what we felt like the audience was expecting from a Mission Impossible movie. You know, we weren't making Stanley Kubrick's Mission Impossible, where we could score uh, a whole movie, you know, with no music, you know. The closest we got, actually, was The Taurus, where he dumped my score and used just breathing. So that was sort of Kubricky now that I think about it. (laughs) But, uh... Um, that was part of the plan, actually, in terms of the way we spotted the film, which is that I literally scored the whole movie. Because there wasn't time to do it more the way he was used to, I thought, I'm going to give him choices. And I scored the whole movie knowing that he would pull stuff, nip and tuck, mixing-wise, to make it fit the movie. I, almost everything in the movie was written for the scene it's used in. There's a few pieces he moved around in, in the mix. But... Uh, there's a lot of music that was written that wasn't used. Well, speaking of the action writing, the uh, what I found fascinating was the, the instrument kinetics and in driving your action. It, it, traditionally, a lot of people rely on strings. You were really writing virtually for horns. Mm. And I found it a very fresh sound. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. I mean, my orchestrational choices were really sort of inspired by my love of the 70s composers. Uh, what Lalo did in the TV show in the 60s as well. Um, but the Williams work from the 70s, Goldsmith's work, even some of the, not so much in an obvious way, but what David Shire had done in the 70s, you know what I mean, fielding. So my choices were, the voice I was using was sort of in the vein of those composers. Um I tend to start a cue at the tempo, you know what I mean? Which I'm sure other composers do that too. I mean, when it's film and it has to be so intrinsically linked with the editing and the rhythm of the picture, you've got to find the right tempo. Then you start to get a sound in your head, you know what I mean? And one of the sounds we loved was in the original TV show to Mission Impossible, uh, especially in the first season. I I can't remember if it carried through the entire series, but uh, 
the head of the IMF would sit down and go through a folder, a dossier of different agents and pick the ones he wanted. And then he would throw down the thing and it would say, like, impossible mission forces. And it would go like, and we just loved how it sort of went from, in the 60s style, it went from nothing to, you know, 200 dB. So that inspired some of the choices, like where the car explodes outside the uh, the um, opera house in Austria. Yeah. Um, the decision in the motorcycle chase is essentially what are you going to be able to hear above the sound design? You know, we've got these motorcycles grinding away. We're cutting from him without a helmet, so we're going to have wind, motorcycles, cars, car horns. You know, what is going to cut through that mix? And horns and brass are sort of your go-tos for that you know high stuff and low stuff too and so the strings are sort of grinding away and giving us energy and and rhythm and tempo but it's the brass that are cutting through the mix and so you feel one and you actually hear the other so yeah you used uh it, so rogue nation was a fully orchestral score you, right you, it was a conscious decision to do that so in the future you know hypothetically if you were to do another or to do another one of mm-hmm. these films would you uh, be open to using electronics absolutely I mean I think it takes all kinds of music to score a film and you know I've done scores that have been entirely electronic in that sort of vein of Blade Runner and Drive mm-hmm. or uh, I think a, a lot of Watchmen was electronic you know um, it just so happened on Mission Impossible that the mandate was sort of a retro coloring. Mm. And my way of achieving that without sort of sounding self-consciously pastiche was to not allow myself to use any electronics at all. Mm. I could write whatever music I wanted, so I wasn't limiting myself in terms of my imagination as a composer, but I was throwing myself a gauntlet a challenge to realize those ideas in an acoustic way. So the opening music for the uh, film over the studio logos with that percussive staccato yeah. music, uh, that actually originated uh, as as music for the Taurus sequence, which I felt like if there was any sequence in the film was going to use synths, it would have been that. Mm-hmm. So I was sort of trying to use an orchestra to replicate the sort of yeah. arpeggiating rhythms of a synth patch, right. you know, that kind of thing. Right. And so I was trying, and then I was sort of switching between bassoons and clarinets and trumpets and horns to try to simulate sort of a filter sweep mm-hmm. uh, on a synthesizer, you know what I mean? Yeah. So the uh, embracing the acoustic instruments sort of kept it sounding like something that could have been written in 66 when Lalo did the pilot, but then I allowed myself to do things that I don't know people were doing back then. You know, we d- we got some cool sound effects for the Taurus sequence that ended up they're on the album, but they were mixed out of the movie, mm-hmm. where one of the percussionists was doing a really cool thing with like a super ball on a bass drum, oh. which created this wonderful sort of moaning sound. You know, mm-hmm. they had a piano at one of the studios where we recorded that had extra keys at the bottom, a Bosendorfer, and the keys were so low that the sound was actually more of a clunk than a note. Uh-huh. And so I just played that in rhythm for the Taurus sequence, and it sort of sounded like that machine spinning around. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it was gong, 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 you know, and just yeah, yeah. trying to do things like that right. and being thinking of creative ways to use acoustic instruments um, that made the audience not miss the absence of electronics. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Congratulations again on Thank you. And everything and success in the thank future. you for coming over.